Hi, everybody. Our next speaker is Alvaro Carrasco. Uh, Alvaro is a senior software engineer at Twitter. Um, he writes TypeScript, Scala, and now Unison. And he's going to tell us about abilities, which is Unison's uh, effect system. Go ahead, Alvaro. Uh, thanks, Runer. So, um, yeah, thank you for that introduction. And um, I would like to say that I'm just a huge fan of Unison. I've been playing with it for quite a while. And uh, I also love functional programming to the extent that it makes us productive. It makes me productive, makes my team teammates productive. So, um, yeah, I love functional programming. Um, I do have some, some opinions about the state of technology at the moment or the, st the state of development. Um, I, I think it is way too hard um, to, to do the things that you want um, to do, to build um, products, to build tools, um, partly because there are too many tools trying to solve too many problems. Uh, and a lot of these problems are not really related to to programming. Um, wouldn't it be nice if if most of our days were spent solving actual programming problems as opposed to build issues and dependency conflicts and all, all kinds of things like that? So th this is one of the reasons I've, I've been uh, I've, I'm attracted to Unison because it it aims to solve a lot of these these problems in a, in a very nice way. And my hope is that. When my kids start doing programming, I have um, two twin boys who are um, 16 years old right now. But but when they, if they decide to do programming professionally, my hope is that they will have a much much better experience, um, and they will have a lot a lot more fun programming if if that's what they they choose to do. Um, so yeah, um, so I, I kind of want to uh, start by discussing like. What I, what I, the approach I've taken to sort of try to teach my kids how to program. And, you know, I started with, with Scratch, MIT Scratch, which is this graphical tool where you drag around blocks. Um, and then it moved on to Khan Academy, and they've done a lot of stuff on an environment kind of like, like this, where they, they write JavaScript code or, or some, something like JavaScript. I, th I think it's JavaScript code. Um, that draws into a canvas. Uh, it's very approachable. The feedback is very immediate. As they make changes, they can see the changes to their code. And I think that's part, part of why it's so successful at helping kids sort of get into it. Um, it's um, the fact that it's graphical and visual um, makes it more, more fun. Um, so I thought, okay, I, I want, well, th this comes with some drawbacks though. So typically these are very imperative APIs. Um, and at some point kids, especially something like Scratch, they, they will outgrow it and they have to move on to sort of like real programming where uh, they don't have all these niceties. But I, I, do, um, I, I do want them to have an experience like this, even if it is with a, with a real, hardcore uh, programming language, maybe one that they would use for work. Um, so what, what are my options uh, here? I, I, I think Unison um, has some really good concepts that are important for kids to learn at the beginning. Things like, uh, I, I think they're important for kids to learn early on, like uh, immutability, modeling with some, some products, because it, it's a simple concept and, and just functions in general. Uh, and also Unison can be very approachable. Uh, it's syntactically very simple. And the Unison code manager um, provides a, a really, um, a, a very sort of exploratory experience when it comes to writing code, saving it for later, and browsing existing code you know, not, not having to worry about syntax and cleaning up. Um, it, it's, it's an experience that's very, um, very interactive, like um, without leaving sort of like a, a mess as you're exploring on your, on your code. Um, so I, I really want one of my kids to use Unison. And I, they did 
do some work on Unison, but I, I, I was missing the whole graphical portion of it that I, I wanted them to build something and, and, and try it immediately, see what it looks like. So um, how do I get there? My, my first uh, thought was, OK, this would work great if Unison could be compiled to JavaScript. That way, I could, I could run it on a browser. Uh, and I'm, I hope that's still the case. That I, I hope that at some point, we get Unison running on the fully in the browser, either through a um, compiled to JavaScript or an interpreter for the, an actual Unison code base. Uh, I think that would be amazing. And I, I hope that we still get that. But I, I, need, something, I need something now. I want, I want to teach them Unison right now. Um, so the next, next thing, is there an existing sort of remote canvas that I can use our command line app written in Unison to send drawing commands to. So I looked for a while. I couldn't. I couldn't find anything exactly like that. Um, and I, but but I did find something called um, Apache Guacamole. Uh, at first, I thought it was maybe hacky for me to try to use this, but um, when I looked at the API, it had a very simple API for for drawing. I could uh, draw, you know, arcs, uh, rectangles, and uh, paths, and pretty much everything I would want out of a sort of like a canvas type of API. And and since it's remote, uh, I don't have to embed it in the language that I'm working in. I could just use networking to send um, send things to it. But when I tried to use it, the the code was it was a little unwieldy, and so I ended up not using this product, but implementing their, their um, protocol for drawing. It turned out to be, it wasn't, it wasn't too complicated. So what I did was create this Electron app that could be installed on a computer um, and ultimately maybe also run from a web browser. Um, but at the moment, just an Electron app that could run alongside a UCM session. Um, and then whenever I, I want to execute um, drawing commands, it would stream those commands to this running Electron app. Uh, written in TypeScript, uh, it's not really um, written in, in any way that makes it specific to Unison. It could be used with any other command line tool. But my, my purpose for, for this was to connect Unison to it. So uh, that's kind of like what the code looks like, is basically parsing commands and sending them to an actual uh, HTML5 uh, canvas using JavaScript. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So my first attempt at doing this, I wrote some Unison code, um, defining what it is to, uh, you know, what some of the commands are. So move to line two, uh, rect, you know, close path, those kind of things. Um, and since I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, functionally declarative, um, I wanted to describe them as a, as a list of commands that the user could create and then stream into the canvas. Um, so I, I was very excited. It, it kind of looked to me like um, how code looks like in Elm. They have something called Elm Canvas. And, and this looks like a very similar approach. I, I thought, look, this is great. Now I can draw onto a canvas. So when I showed it to my kids, um, their first thought was, it's not as nice as JavaScript. Um, and I'm like, OK, OK, OK. Um, that's, that's fair. Uh, JavaScript can be more, more straightforward, more imperative. Um, but it comes with, I tried to explain that it comes with all these benefits of and this being a description of what you want done as opposed to uh, a, a set of steps and describing how you want it done. Uh, the, the typical <laughs> description that people give for the benefit of declarative programming. Um, and they, they literally give me this face. Um, very skeptical. Um, so like, OK, don't worry about that. You, you get used to the to the syntax. You, you get used to this style of programming. And again, I literally got this face again. <laughs> um, luckily, when I, I posted uh, this to the Unison uh, Slack channel, 
I, I can't remember who, but somebody mentioned, you know, you, you could do an imperative API using abilities and it doesn't have to look like this. So light bulb uh, went, went on and I took a crack at it. So um, I'd like to, um, see, is that the last thing I have? Yeah, I, I'd like to um, demo what I um, ended up building. But but real quick, they're, they're not, they're not wrong. Um, sometimes, depending on what it is that we're trying to do, an imperative API is better than a declarative one. Um, that's partly why we have something like Monas that can describe uh, sequential uh, things, and why we have syntax like Haskell's do notation. Um, that's basically an imperative API to a declarative, um, you know, a, a declar declarative approach behind the scenes. Same with the Scala for comprehension, um, but it, but it's not it's not perfect. It it is a step that you have to take outside of what you normally would have done, um, in, and you have to lift um, every step into the, the mona that you're trying to uh, sequence. Um, it's it's not um, as 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 nice as clean as it could be, and of course that's what they they. Um, recognize when comparing it to uh, JavaScript. Um, sometimes we want something that looks imperative, um, especially when we're trying to model something uh, that is imperative behind the scenes, and we're trying to maintain to that to those semantics. Uh, so things like I.O., uh, future exceptions, or, or even defining uh, flows, um, there are things that maybe we want them to be declarative and behind the scenes, but we want to work with them and define them in, in, a, in an imperative way. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think that's all I have on the, on the, on the slides or on the Unison Core Manager or um, share. I'm going to um, share now some code. Let's see. Okay, so here's a function that draws a happy face onto a canvas. So the interesting thing is that it looks a lot like it would on an imperative language like, like JavaScript. Uh, I have commands that seem to directly just execute an action, drawing to, this, to the screen. Um, there's no sort of like trying to represent it in, in a declarative way. This is very, very imperative. Um, but the, um, it's, but how is this possible in a language that's purely functional? Uh, well, it's because of this, um, canvas layer ability. Um, it, it provides, um, this functionality that whenever a function that gets called that requires an ability, like this um, size function or this arc or fill, it basically stops execution of the program, uh, sends the information um, that you're um, passing to the um, to the function, sends it to the ability, the thing that's handling the ability, and that ability can decide what to do with it. Um, and it can decide to not execute any of this code. It could decide to execute this code many times. Uh, it could decide to store something internally for later use based on the parameters of this code. Uh, or it could um, collect um, information about this running code Oh, sorry, that's what I just said. It, it could delay the execution of this code for later and then execute it at a later point, um, sort of uh, semantically blocking until the next step. But, but uh, this code doesn't have to worry about how the canvas layer or, or what the canvas layer ability uh, decides to do. 
um, as long as um, the methods are available and you can call them, um, how the canvas layer is implemented, you know, it, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, it could also decide to stream these commands as it's running to the canvas um, that I have in running elsewhere, the actual UI. Um, all right, so first I'm going to show a, an implementation of the canvas layer that just takes all of these drawings, I mean, all of these commands, and outputs them as a list, because maybe we do want to get them as a declarative, um, in a declarative uh, form. So if I do something like, I suppose I could do it on a, um, yeah, I have it here as a watch expression. So this um, cam or this uh, ability handler takes all the commands that were uh, ran that do something with a canvas layer and produces a, a list of them. So I haven't I haven't lost any of this sort of declarative power that I had previously. I still have um, this list that I could um, do anything I could before with it. I could and process it in some way and remove some of the, some commands or add other ones or put a delay in between each one. Uh, I have all this sort of like sort of like declarative power that I had before. But the API is it's imperative. Uh, now if I want a different implementation, one that say actually sends these to um, to the um, my running canvas um, let's see. Created this function called uh, Happy Face Main. I should probably uh, show that function first. Okay, so this function starts with a, a session to the canvas that I, I I have running in Electron, and then it draws that Happy Face at a particular layer and sends the sync command, which tells it to to actually perform the drawing. So if I run this, uh, but actually before I run it, I have to start the canvas. So there, and you can see it uh, it drew the happy face. Now that, that's a nice start, but um, this is a very very simple graphic. I want to do something more more complex. I, I want to draw something. Uh, maybe from an SVG set of of paths. Um, so I'm gonna take this out. So uh, for SVG, I actually might I want to go a little bit into detail on something else. Uh, I'm gonna share the tab again. Um, Can't find the app, but let's go back to the, the screen. I'm not sure why I didn't find it, but here it is. So if I have a, a list of SVG paths that were maybe drawn with a tool like Inkscape or something like that, um, here's an example of a code that would parse that list of commands and, um, and produce um, a list of actual um, path command uh, a path command type that describes those commands. Uh, 
So here's just another example of using an ability, sort of in an imperative way to uh, do parsing. And that's something I have to do in order to implement the SVG path rendering thing. So I can now uh, demo, let's see, something a little bit more complex. Um, okay, so uh, here is uh, um, a set of um, of paths. So this is basically an, an SVG drawing I made with Inkscape, but I entered all of the paths manually into Unison. So Unison is the one actually doing all of the drawing thing, uh, all, all the drawing commands here. So this is actually yeah drawn by, by Unison, just using data from an SVG file. Uh, okay, so th this is cool, and I can I can draw something more complex. But now, next step is I, I want to animate this. <laughs> so, um, cool. next step, I need some some way to loop and and send data uh, at regular intervals to the canvas while while drawing. So I wrote this uh, loop function that also uses abilities um, because it um, executes forever, obtains the current time uh, timestamp. And then um, before it executes again, it delays execution by a certain amount. So there's a case of the ability um, receiving this, um, this request and deciding not to continue executing until a little bit later. So it's a case of an ability used to just delay execution of something asynchronously. Um, OK, so now using that function, uh, here I have an, an example of a spinning wheel. OK, I have to go back, actually. Not too bad. <laughs> um, now I thought, okay, let's apply this uh, to the car itself. Um, so let's see. And there we go. Now we have a car with moving wheels. Um, this is all drawn with Unison. The uh, Electron app that is actually uh, doing this is it's just receiving very raw, basic draw commands. But the timing, the um, yeah, the, the, the timing, the transformation from paths to actual Canvas commands is all being done um, with Unison using the Canvas layer and Canvas abilities. Um, all right, let's see what else we have here. Um, Right. After I got animation working, I thought, okay, what what do I actually need to make a game? Um, I haven't been able to make a, a game yet, but um, the, the thing I need first is some sort of um, way to deal with interaction. I need the, the canvas to be able to send information back into Unison so Unison can adjust how it... Um, you know what what to render so i, I tried to use um elm elm canvas as a or elm the elm architecture as a sort of uh, inspiration for it um and here's here's an example that uses um interaction so um trying to follow the, the basic elm pattern i have uh, an initial value for my model which is just the position of the mouse um, so let me move this down. Yeah. Um, then I have a function that will do the initial setup, which means just sizing the window. Um, it, it can take the model, but it, in this case, it doesn't use it. Then I have a function that updates the model whenever an event happens. And that event could be the mouse moving or a click 
or a tick from the um, timer that's constantly executing the code. Uh, and then I have a, a function, a very simple function that just um, draws based on the state of the model. Um, so it doesn't have to be worry about timing or anything like that. It just examines the model and performs the necessary drawing operation to um, to do the animation. Um, and then I, I, I run it. So um, yeah, let's try running it. Oh, at first, this is just drawing a circle wherever the the cursor is. So pretty simple. <laughs> there we go. So. I, I barely got this to work um, yesterday, so I I hope uh, next time I can actually do something more more interesting where maybe you can pick colors and and and, and draw other things. Um, but I, I just w was very excited that you know I have two way communication between the canvas and Unison, and um, uh, yeah, um, just wanted to show it off. And um, okay, the the main thing I wanted to leave with is is the fact that the abilities are are super powerful. Here I use them for uh, providing an imperative API to a declarative, uh, sort of like a declar declar declarative approach. Uh, I used abilities for the parsing portion, um, being able to write very direct style of parsing, you know, extract this, extract that without having to use these combinators as I would on a regular, like a parser combinator library. Uh, I was also able to use abilities to do concurrency where I um, send events, tick events, to this running um, drawing operation, um, and concurrency so I can stream data coming from the canvas to the um, to my to my drawing calculation. So it's uh, it's everywhere, and and using it is uh, feels feels natural. Um, so yeah, that, that's my my presentation. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Alvaro. Uh, that, that was mind blowing. Uh, Chris, are there any questions? Sure. Uh, we definitely do. Uh, I actually just want to start it off and ask, um, as you were learning abilities, you kind of talked about how you're, you started off with like an Elm interface where you were kind of, you know, just building up this list bit by bit. Um, what, as you made the switch to abilities, what was kind of the trickiest part about grokking this new sort of way of programming? Did you did you get caught up at all, or, or did you have some sort of aha moment at some point where it all clicked into place? Uh, I feel like I had several aha moments. Um, it was yeah, understanding the the handlers that that was the mm. toughest portion, um, and it it almost seems like it it was too too generic uh, a solution that this idea of the handler and the resume to to solve so many different unrelated problems and it took me a, a some some experimenting to get past that hmm mm -hmm. it's actually um <laughs> too general to to understand how it applies to your your more specific case yep but, yeah. but I feel like once once I, I got past it, I, I kept seeing more and more mm -hmm. potential uses for it. And I came to understand other uses that I, ha I had seen already on the Unison base, like the exception handling mm -hmm. and 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 things like and things like delay. Right, yeah. And and uh, I saw Paul released a, a debugger that's fully implemented with abilities too, which I, I believe it can actually rewind and re-execute and and all of that stuff is very cool. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's a, quite a quite a superpower. Absolutely. And what I love about it is that um, it's something that if you're just starting out, you don't have to understand. Uh, I feel like my kids can do all kinds of stuff with the animation code mm. um, without getting to abilities yet. Sort of, they know they need a, a reference to the ability, and they can use it, but they don't have to worry about how it's implemented or the complexities of it. 
Right. Yeah. And, and you don't have to worry about some of those traditionally tricky things like, um, you know, lifting monads or, or binding everything together. Did, did you have experience with previous effects systems or, or monads or anything like that? Or are you coming into this uh, kind of fresh? Just just in Scala. So I mm. had some experience you know, doing um, just uh, like um, Cat's I.O. and, uh, and Monex and mm. using four mm. comprehensions. Um, but yeah, but there's a whole, a whole other level. <laughs> Whole new thing, yeah. And, um, and the fact that even on those systems, mixing them up is 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 complex, and mixing abilities has been pretty easy um, for mm. me. And um, it's almost um, like they, they don't get in each other's ways. Right. Yeah. And they, uh, yeah, you don't have to pick a, a monad stack right when you're when you're writing your your code. They kind of compose in a in a nice way there. Um, did you, I, I'd be curious, did you go through any iterations on your Canvas API when you were first kind of figuring out how abilities work? Uh, did you, did you come up with multiple designs or, or was it pretty natural to find the one that ended up working for you? Um, I think I, at first I was stuck on producing this list of commands and mm -hmm. then sending them in batches. Okay. Um, but then I, because I, I, I had that to command list function, and I thought, okay, that's the simplest way to do it. But then mm -hmm. when I started looking into how the stream ability was implemented, I realized I, I don't have to collect these. I could send mm -hmm. them off as soon as I get each one, and there's, there's no reason to delay. Uh, so then I went through another iteration of implementing that concept. Uh, and that also helped solidify the concept of, of abilities and, and how handlers work. Hmm. Mm -hmm. and that, but that it was, was probably cool that start with the list first. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Learn kind of. Uh, well, that's almost static. Static analysis, right? Like you can kind of see what you were planning to do in your code, and and uh, you can interpret that in any way that you like as well. Uh, however, I assume probably the streaming method is was necessary when you started interleaving these delays. Uh, you know, you can't. Uh, or animating, right? You you can't get the full list of commands if you have to wait at, at certain points in there. Uh, yep, yep, that, that's exactly that right. Up working. Great. Um, I would ask. Uh, so, when you first started doing this, uh, and I know from from Slack conversations and stuff, um, you were just trying to figure out a way to get Unison to communicate with with something uh, outside of itself. Uh, were there any key features or extension points to to Unison or UCM uh, that you'd be really interested in seeing us add in the future that would make that sort of either plug-in or, or integration with other tools easier? Uh, one would be um, if I could con do WebSockets. Mm -hmm. Because um, I'm, I'm hoping all of this code that I have here, here can run on a, on a browser, not just on an Electron app running locally, but may maybe connect to a remote uh, canvas. Uh, like mm -hmm. literally remote on you know somebody else's screen, um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to more more sort of like those kind of network possibilities. Definitely, yeah, we'll uh, we'll take that down. Um, uh, I, I've actually often heard uh, Haskell described as um, you know the world's best imperative language, uh, and it seems like there's kind of a common belief that actually this sort of monadic style, once you have something equivalent to do notation or, or Unison's abilities, uh, is actually a really nice way to model imperative code. Um, from now on, do you think you'll model all of your Unison programs in this imperative style or just when you're modeling a, a more imperative process like drawing on a canvas? Um, I, th I think, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think, uh... I would not use it for everything, um, mostly for things that, as you said, are have this imperative feel to them, hmm. which is a lot of them. Um, but uh, yeah, in, in some cases, I, I think if, yeah, there are other things where you want to combine things in, in ways that that doesn't really feel monadic. And I, I wouldn't try to, um, yeah, I, I feel like I still <laughs> like the, the style, the applicative style or, I don't sure. know if I'm using that correctly, but the <laughs> um, of sort of um, combining things together as opposed to executing them in sequence, and uh, mm -hmm. if if that's what the, the model calls for. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. You want to model your program. However, it most naturally maps. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so after you inevitably get uh, interaction and games working, um, do you do you have a dream? Do you have a future? Do you have an end goal? Uh, when will your kids be satisfied with what you're able to build for them? I, I feel like it's pretty close. Um, I would like to ma make a, a framework that can uh, sort mm. of... Um, okay, okay, so right now, <laughs> I want it to stay imperative because that, that's the basics of drawing. But sometimes animation is better handled in a declarative way. Once mm -hmm. you've gotten like the, the core imperative um, sort of like building blocks. Um, so um, yeah, I would love to maybe build another abstraction on top of this that actually is declarative uh, where you can specify things like um, gravity, um, in, in, in velocity, inertia, and things just sort of behave in that way without having to tell them uh, you know, modify this model by this amount. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, yeah, I think that would be the next step. And and you know, in that case, right? Maybe you can uh, provide two different interfaces for the same the same backing drawing library, or uh, you know, use the same ability and interpret it in different ways. That that would be very cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I for one will be very interested to play the first game that your kids make uh, with this thing. <laughs> That'll be very cool. Um, was there anything that was extra surprising to you about abilities uh, or their their power? I, I know we've talked a little bit about it, but uh, if there's anything that stands out, um, I think I think con concurrency. How, how um, and well, two things I guess. Concurrency, the the, the, um, the stuff on the STM library, mm -hmm. which I, is what I ended up using. I, I used a queue, uh, a concurrent queue for the events. Okay, um, mm -hmm. and. It, it sounded complicated to me, but when I used it, it, it came out very natural. So that was kind of shocking how, how simple it was and how I didn't have to uh, think through all these concurrent uh, concepts. It, mm. it was very natural to use. Uh, same with the mutable stuff, like the uh, T-VAR. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised how natural it became after I, I started playing with it. Mm. That's great. Uh, chat is demanding an answer. Were the kids finally impressed with what you managed to build for them? Uh, not yet, because I, I've, I've actually shown you guys before I've shown them. So <laughs> I'm, I'm we're, we're the they software will audience. Be. Yeah, they're they're the tougher audience, I think, right? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll add a little bit more nice nice functions to help them before mm. I, I get them started on it. Uh, is all of this code available for you know if participants in the conference want to want to check out some of it? Is it is it pushed up somewhere? I'm sure. Uh, I haven't pushed the latest version, but I, I will um, tonight. So uh, yeah, it's on GitHub for the Canvas. It's in a, a project called Clarity under my GitHub mm -hmm. uh, name, um, mm -hmm. and um, I'll push to share. <laughs>